A cursed colonel. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. We've profiled many a strange life on Ghost Town Podcast, and I have to admit, when I first started researching today's episode, I was looking more at the controversy and mystery surrounding KFC's secret recipe chicken than the Colonel Sanders himself. But my research took a turn when I realized how absolutely insane the godfather of fast food fried chicken actually was. So days and many articles later, I'm here to tell the story of Harland David Sanders, Father, farmer, lawyer, midwife, grifter, salesman, ferryboat captain, fireman, cook, violent defender, and philanderer, but also, arguably, the most iconic face in the history of fried chicken. Harland David Sanders was born on September 9, 1890, on a small farm in Henryville, Indiana, to Wilbert Sanders, a butcher, and Margaret Ann Dunnev. Just five years into his quiet Midwestern life, the chaos that would characterize Harland's life began. In 1895, his father closed his butcher shop early and stumbled home in the middle of the day, feverish and pale. He would die quickly thereafter. Wilbert Sanders' sudden death put the Sanders family into a tailspin, forcing Margaret to take work at a local tomato canning factory, in addition to doing freelance sewing for nearby families, work that took the devout Christian away from her young children for days at a time. In alignment with his mother's strict values, often espousing, quote, the evils of alcohol, tobacco, gambling, and whistling on Sundays, the not even 10-year-old Harland was forced to take care of the home and two young siblings, honing his cooking skills and efforts to keep the family together. And hone he did. By the age of seven in 1897, Harland was skilled with making bread and vegetables and, quote, improving with meat. The three children would cook what they foraged while their mother was away, working. It was, of course, a wildly different time. In 1899, Margaret remarried a man named Edward Park, and he died almost immediately. At 10, Harlan took a job at a nearby farm and dropped out of school after sixth grade to work at the farm full time. His reason was that he hated algebra, but sounds like the family just needed more help. Margaret, also desperate to improve the family's financial situation, married a produce farmer named William Brodius, who moved the family to a suburb of Indianapolis. Harland did not like his new stepfather, who used any excuse to throw punches at him and his siblings. Within a year, Margaret kicked Harland out of the house, and he took a job painting horse carriages in Indianapolis. A year later, he went back to Clark County, Indiana, to work a $15 a month job, plus room and board, as a farmhand and general handyman. At the ripe old age of 15, Harlan Sanders would practice a variety of wild jobs and essentially end any childhood he may have once had, which was clearly not much. In 1906, Sanders went to live with his uncle in New Albana, Indiana, where he secured a new job as a railway conductor. In October of that year, 16-year-old Sanders falsified his date of birth and enlisted in the United States Army, completing his service commitment as a wagoner in Cuba. He did so well in Cuba that he was given the Pacification Medal, an award created to recognize service during the United States occupation of Cuba. He was honorably discharged in February 1907 and moved to Sheffield, Alabama, where he reunited with his brother Clarence, who had also moved there in order to escape their shitty stepfather. Briefly working as a blacksmith's assistant, Sanders moved to Jasper, Alabama, where he got a job cleaning out the ash pans of trains from the Northern Alabama Railroad. Ash seemed to agree with him, so he became a steam engine stoker for three years, though at 19 he got sick and didn't come to work, and was then fired for insubordination. It was as a laborer for the Norfolk Western Railway when he met Josephine King, and the two were married on June 15, 1909. They would go on to have three children, Margaret Josephine, Harland David Jr., and Mildred Marie, and moved together to Jacksonville, Tennessee to start their married life. Sanders then spent a brief period as a part-time midwife, helping to deliver about eight babies in the Kentucky Hills, then went back to gigging at the railroad as a steam engine stoker by day and studying law by correspondence through the LaSalle Extension University. Sanders lost his day job after getting into an all-out brawl with a colleague. Fistfights seemed to characterize Sanders' professional life. We'll get to another one later. But it was the end of the line for Josephine, who was fed up with all the weird jobs and moving. She packed up the Sanders kids and went to live with her parents. In 1912, tragedy struck again. Sanders' son, Harlan David Sanders Jr., 
died of complications from blood poisoning that he contracted during a routine tonsillectomy, which even at the time was commonly regarded as a simple, very low-key medical procedure. According to John Ed Pierce, one of the colonel's biographers, this put Sanders into a deep, deep depression. But he decided maybe he'd keep with the law and see where that went. So for three years, he established a criminal law practice in Little Rock, Arkansas, still estranged from his wife. His aims were not just money. Being a down-and-out railroad worker for so long, Sanders sought justice for the lower-class people of the region. At one point, he was able to negotiate better settlements for the mostly Black victims of a train wreck, and was a loud and active resistor of the common practice of courts pressuring low-class defendants into settlements. Eventually, he earned enough in legal fees for his family to move back in with him, but that was a short-lived reunion. Sanders' legal career officially ended after he got into a fistfight in a courtroom with his own client, apparently over unpaid legal fees. Despite being a non-drinker, smoker, and devout Christian, John Ed Pierce also wrote, quote, Sanders had encountered repeated failure largely through bullheadedness, a lack of self-control, impatience, and a self-righteous lack of diplomacy. So Sanders' family went back to live with his mother-in-law, and Sanders himself went back to Indiana to live with his own mother. That's pretty rough. After a series of hires and fires, in 1920, at the age of 30, Sanders started his own ferry boat company, which was actually successful. With the momentum of his new reputable businessman status, in 1922, he took up a job as a secretary at the Chamber of Commerce in Columbus, Indiana. But he resigned after less than a year, saying he was bad at his job. Sanders cashed in his ferry boat company shares for $22,000, over $350,000 today, and met an inventor who discovered how to operate natural gas lamps on a gas derived from carbide. Sanders, fired up and inspired, immediately bought the patent rights and launched a manufacturing company. But the timing could not be worse. There was a new technology in town that ran Sanders' business into the ground. Electricity. A rural electrification program made Sanders' company product obsolete almost immediately. In 1924, the general manager of Standard Oil of Kentucky took pity on Sanders and hired him to run a service station in Nicholasville, Kentucky. In 1930, the station closed as a result of the Great Depression, but another oil station opened in North Corbin, Kentucky, and Sanders transferred over there to manage that one. Corbin was a shitty place in the middle of nowhere and was pretty lawless. According to Sanders himself, quote, bootleggins, fights, and shootings was as regular as a rooster's crowing in the morning. But the ragtag station managed to stay open enough for Sanders to actually get some business traction, and dare I say it, a better reputation. In the back storeroom, Sanders put a big table and began calling the service station Sanders Service Station and Cafe. Hungry travelers were drawn in by the big painted signs on the roadside barns north and south of town. Sanders hired a couple waitstaff, making a point to pay them a living wage and strictly forbid them from accepting tips. He also invited his estranged family back, who helped out at the station. Using the kitchen and the apartment in back, Sanders cooked up steak, ham, potatoes, gravy, grits, and biscuits. Surprisingly, chicken was not often on the menu. Sanders was a bit of a chicken perfectionist, and poultry took too long to cook. But Sanders loved chicken and experimented with it constantly, often making it a special on the menu. Everyone liked the food, even the chicken. An entry in The Adventures in Good Eating, written by iconic food critic Duncan Hines, describes Sanders' service station and cafe in the Standard Oil service station as, quote, a very good place to stop en route to Cumberland Falls and the Great Smokies. Continuous 24-hour service. Sizzle and steaks, fried chicken, country ham, hot biscuits. 50 cents to a dollar. To entertain his favorite customers, Sanders would occasionally take friends around back to listen to a braying donkey in an adjacent lot. I mean, what can I say? It was the Great Depression in rural Kentucky. But Sanders got a little too good at his job. He got into an actual shootout with his only competitor, a local service hospitality magnate named Matt Stewart, over the repainting of a sign directing traffic to his Standard Oil service station. In an ambush of the service station, Stewart killed an employee who was with Sanders and was eventually convicted of murder, eliminating any competition Sanders had. It was a bad thing, a very bad thing, that became a weird game changer for Sanders and his chicken. In 1935, Harlan Sanders was given the title that would define the rest of his life and branding, Honorary Colonel, by then Kentucky Governor Ruby Lafoon. His local popularity grew, and in 1939, he acquired a motel in Asheville, North Carolina, creating an even bigger restaurant and hotel experience. Well, he tried. Because in November 1939, the hotel was completely burned down in a local fire. 
But Sanders rebuilt the Byrne Motel and gave it a chic new facelift that included a 140-seat restaurant, his first real restaurant. By July 1940, at age 50, Sanders had developed a pressure cooking system to fry chicken to golden brown in about eight minutes, and he'd perfected his long-evolving secret spice blend by adding an 11th ingredient, a secret that is closely guarded to this day, although might not be a secret anymore. We'll get to that in a bit. In addition, Sanders invented a cracklin' gravy, which took advantage of the bits of breading left in the oil after frying, a little texture that became a fan favorite of local patrons. On that delicious note, let's take a break. Hi, hello, how are you? Hello. How are you doing? You doing okay? We're checking in. Hello. And you're checking out. Well, please don't. We want to say hello to anyone who's listening, spreading the good word, supporting us. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Propping us up. When we're down. Which is always, you're always propping, <laughs> it's in a constant state of propping us up. Yes, yes, yes. We need to be. We need, our egos need to be fed, <laughs> please. And it doesn't take much. No, it doesn't, it doesn't. We, our egos are pretty rock bottom, so literally anything. Yeah, help us out, help us out, will ya? Mm. I still have a cold, if you can't hear already, this is not how I am now. I will return to my normal annoying voice that everyone hates, <laughs> I promise. Again, I'm optimal health, everything's running perfectly, yep. getting younger. Younger by the day. By the second. Mm, that's oh. good. That's nice for you. I mean, I I, I guess that's that's okay. That's okay. I just got these long, luscious lashes. It's probably <laughs> my biggest flaw. People are like, oh, what's like the worst thing about you? It's probably my, my yeah. lashes are too full. They obstruct your view? Luscious and long. Yeah, that's <laughs> wow. like probably my... It's a bummer. That's yeah. a bummer. I'm sorry. Uh, that and I'm a pyromaniac, I guess, might be the other one. I don't know. Where no, that that's, go. Not, that's, that's good. Yeah. It's a, it's a skill. Yeah. It's a skill set. Yeah. People could use that. I don't know. And... We would never, ever burn down Mm-mm. our government. Mm-mm. Why would we do that? No. Be Mm-mm. crazy. Mm-mm. The mayors. In long lashes order. <laughs> Longest lash to shortest lash? Yeah, but they're all really long. Okay. It's like freak show long. Wow, this but is, this La- is them in order. This is Latisse country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Coming up, I guess last or first, Cat mm-hmm. Joselle. Hello. So that's either the best or the worst. We don't know yet. Yeah, you want it's, to be in the middle on this one, I think. Well, yeah, I, I just we just want to drive you mad trying to figure it out. Yeah, who is it? Who is it? Charlie Gilbert. Hello. And with the longest or shortest long is <laughs> lashes, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ashley Matson. Nice work, Ashley. And a uh-huh. a genetic freak show. Whoa! Everything exactly as is. Whoa! You Ma- won the lash. Lottery eyebrows are just—they don't need any like threat. It's no, just perfect. No, nothing. Wow. Stuff. Not a dead end in sight. No, no, no. Not a line. Never. Not a wrinkle. No, yeah, not a gray. Nothing. Wow. And it, it, wow. It, but if it was just thought I was like, I'd like one gray. You can have it. Yeah, sure. Whatever you want. You'd be like better. <laughs> and if she's like, no, it's like also better. <laughs> Would be our governor who's. Probably drinking the blood of something to stay yeah, that useful. Absolutely, which we support. Which we support. Absolutely. In this in this context, we support this absolutely. conspiracy theory. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, huge fans. <laughs> Avian Noble. Noble. So if you want no ads, no chit chat, bonus episodes, only the good stuff. And if you want to try out our Patreon for mm-hmm. free for seven days, oh, see if you like it. That might be fun. See if it's cool. Mm. See if it rocks. Mm-hmm. Check out some bonies. If you want to mm-hmm. listen to some ad free stuff, there's mm-hmm. plenty of stuff on there. Nice. Give it a shot. Mm-hmm. It's there. Nice. Check it out. Take it for a test drive. We cut the brakes. No, we didn't. We no, want you to come safe. back. You're safe. I swear but to we God. We want you to check it out, see if you like it. And if you don't, you don't. That's no big deal. You just got to check fun. it out. I don't know. It might be fun. Patreon.com slash ghost town pod. A, a nice seven day free trial of something. Yeah, How it's, great it's is a, that? It's a, a lovely, comfy thing. And you know? listening to the episode itself in general is a lifetime free <laughs> <laughs> to the end of time. Yes. And that's what we want. And we want you to listen to it to the absolute end of time. We need we need that. We need that. Please do that. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe a side of Wild, 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 wild fast food pioneer. Oh, hell yeah. Tearing up the US <laughs> and A. Truly, truly. Let's get back to Colonel Sanders, where, listen, it's the 1940s. As the United States entered World War II in December 1941, bad things keep happening. Tourism came to a screeching halt, and Sanders was forced to close his Asheville Motel and Restaurant. 
instead running military cafeterias for the wartime effort in Oakwood, Tennessee. Although he worked there until nearly the end of the war, Sanders would only later learn what the thousands of individuals he fed spent their days working on. The Oakwood, Tennessee base was key in developing uranium-235 for use in the atomic bomb. In 1947, Josephine filed for divorce, likely finally being very over the fact that Sanders had a mistress, a woman named Claudia Lettington Price. It was an open secret that Claudia was equal parts waitress and mistress, a longtime fixture at the service station whom Sanders eventually made its manager. The 1950s began with more shit news in Sanders' world, because of course it did. But by this point, he was used to it. The highways were being renovated all across the country per the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 to create a nationalized road system. The old highway, right up against the service station, wasn't making money anymore, nor was the restaurant. In 1956, Sanders auctioned off the site of his restaurant, taking a loss on the sale. With no income, he was forced to scrape by a living on his savings, the proceeds of the auction, and his social security check of $105 per month. But he still wanted to be a colonel, and continued to introduce himself as such. He also started to put together his signature look, the look we know today, growing a salt and pepper goatee and wearing black frock suits with a Kentucky-style string tie. On his way to a religious conference in Australia, something he decided to do in an effort to eliminate profanity and become much more Southern comfort, with what we might now consider his own personal brand, he stopped off in Salt Lake City, Utah, to say hello to his fellow friend Pete Herman, another Christian teetotaler whom he had met at a restaurant convention in Chicago years before. Sanders had a new business plan brewing that he wanted Herman to be a part of. Now, leaning solely into his chicken— Sanders decided that if he couldn't keep his own restaurant, he'd go to other establishments, selling his delicious chicken recipe and expertise. He offered Herman a first go at franchising his Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe, in return for four cents on every chicken sold, and mostly, out of pity, Herman accepted. But surprising everyone, Herman saw a huge boost in sales after he started serving Sanders' chicken. So he kept going with Claudia in tow driving across the country and trying to franchise in his own hospitality-forward way. First, Sanders would stop in a high-profile restaurant on the roadside and convince the owner to let him cook chicken for his restaurant's employees. If the owner said yes and he liked the chicken, he'd cook at the restaurant for a couple of days, and if that went well, a franchise agreement would happen. It was a slow, expensive, and humbling way to get partnership. In the meantime, Sanders and his wife sometimes would live out of their car meal to meal but it worked. By 1964, Sanders had franchised over 600 food establishments and had finally built a company worth millions of dollars with enduring success. The craziest thing, this is all before even the first brick-and-mortar KFC would even be built. In 1964, at the age of 74, Colonel Sanders was actually consistently thriving. He had resisted offers to sell his company, even fielding threats that if he didn't sell, his estate would be ravaged by taxes. Later that year, he did end up selling Kentucky Fried Chicken for $2 million. But that wasn't the end of his connection to Kentucky Fried Chicken. He was Colonel Sanders, the face and mascot of KFC, after all. He appeared on television, conducted press interviews, and visited individual restaurants as a spokesperson for the company. In 1971, the company sold again, and Sanders was pissed. So much so that he decided to open his own new restaurant called Colonel Sanders' Dinner House. KFC shot back with legal action, so Sanders decided to sue the company he began for $122 million. KFC responded back by suing him for trademark infringement. They settled in 1975 to an undisclosed amount, but Sanders got the message. Though KFC was no longer his, he would be tied to it, legally and probably spiritually, for the rest of his life. Sanders got in trouble again with KFC, which of course was still called Kentucky Fried Chicken until much later. But in 1978, he gave an interview complaining that KFC gravy tasted like, quote, wallpaper paste, and the new chicken recipe was horrible. The franchise where he gave the interview tried to sue him for libel, but since he was talking about the whole company and not just the location, the case was eventually thrown out. Liking it or not, Sanders worked for KFC for the rest of his life, touring the country on Kentucky Fried Chicken's behalf. For the last two decades of his life, he was never seen in public wearing anything but a white suit though he wouldn't miss an opportunity to complain about the erosion of the KFC product. According to a New Yorker article from 1970, quote, During most of his waking hours, the colonel is haunted by the fear that someone somewhere is doing something to hurt his chicken, that some upstart in the company is tampering with the recipe, or that a careless franchisee is undercooking or overcooking. 
The colonel is vexed almost beyond endurance by the subject of gravy. The gravy now served by the KFC franchisees is good, but it isn't the colonel's. Quote, let's face it, the colonel's gravy was fantastic, but you had to be a Rhodes Scholar to cook it, a company executive has explained. It involved too much time, it left too much room for human error, and it was too expensive. This attitude is incomprehensible to the colonel, who believes that making money is a reward for the virtuous, not a matter of cost accounting. Besides, he would rather have memorable gravy than extra profits. Colonel Harlan David Sanders died in 1980 at the age of 90 of leukemia and is buried in Western Hill Cemetery in Louisville, Kentucky. At the time of his death, there was an estimated 6,000 KFC outlets in 48 countries worldwide, with 2 billion in sales annually. Until his death, Sanders and his wife Claudia lived in a two-story, 10-room house outside of Louisville, giving away much of their money to local nonprofits. According to the restaurant, Harlan Sanders' legacy is as much a part of modern KFC today as it was during his life. Many celebrities have stepped in to play the colonel in advertising campaigns, including Randy Quaid, Daryl Hammond, Ray Liotta, and Rob Lowe. Speaking of campaigns, KFC also has some of the most strange and subversive ones, including our December 9th episode on the KFC design you can see from space. And of course, it's not an episode about KFC unless we talk about secret recipes. According to the company, they still use the same chicken recipe with the highly guarded 11 herbs and spices, whose secret was only available up until a time to select employees bound by a confidentiality contract and kept hidden in a safe in Kentucky. For further protection, two separate companies each blended a portion of the mixture, which was then run through a computer processing system to standardize its blending. Rumor had it that the employees who knew the blend couldn't ever travel together by plane or auto to further safeguard the secret, and that once, when KFC modernized its security systems, the recipe was temporarily moved to another secret, secure location via an armored car, which was further guarded by a high-security motorcade. But of course, a couple holes were found in this solid and intimidating secret protocol. In 2016, the recipe for the spice blend used to prepare the famous KFC chicken may have been accidentally revealed to a reporter named Jay Jones for the Chicago Tribune by Joe Lettington, Colonel Sanders' nephew. Jones was sent to Corbin, Kentucky to write a story for the Tribune's travel section about Colonel Sanders' chicken origin story. While there, he met up with Lettington, who showed Jones a family scrapbook that belonged to Claudia, Sanders' second wife. Her last will and testament was in the back of the scrapbook, and its final pages contained, wait for it, a handwritten recipe for a blend of 11 spices. They are salt, thyme, basil, oregano, celery salt, black pepper, dried mustard, paprika, garlic salt, ground ginger, and white pepper. You can find that picture of the recipe online in many places. It's very available to the public if you so choose. In a later phone interview, Lettington said that he had never shown the recipe to a reporter before and did not know for sure if it was as authentic as he first said. He didn't take any more interviews after that, surprisingly enough. In the past, KFC has sued over the recipe's authenticity. The one thing that I think KFC owners and Colonel Sanders would have agreed upon, the one thing, is that it was very bad that this hard-won, carefully cultivated secret chicken weapon would be so readily revealed to the public. It's not just about the 11 spices, of course, but the wild story behind them. (laughs) 